leader to the Milwaukee market. And uh, we keep bringing him back because the reviews that we get from realtors have been stellar. 98% of realtors, when we surveyed them, said that uh, Mark's presentation was significant, significant for them and would help them to improve their business. And the one person that didn't feel that way was having a bad day. So, you know, <laughs> you just sometimes can't place them all. And uh, so the results from the realtors were, were really good when we did post uh, surveys. Um, Mark is one of North America's top speakers on real estate. But I think what we really like about Mark and why when we looked across the country and North America for a speaker, we selected him, was that he's walked in all of your shoes. So he was the top realtor, he was the top managing broker, owner, and uh, now he is one of the top real estate sales trainers. So he's done it all. He's often featured at the National Real Estate Convention, and, and we feel really good that we can bring him here uh, to you. Before I do uh, the final introduction on Mark, I just want to talk about a survey that BMO Harris just conducted about millennials. So uh, those generation uh, that are you know, looking to purchase homes. And we really did the survey to find out where are they at in their thought process about home ownership after the downturn of the housing market. And I think we all feel like we're on the uptick. How many of you would say that real estate today feels much better than it did even a year ago? Yeah, good. So we're feeling that, and it feels really good again. And and um, so we did the survey to find out kind of where are they at. You know, do they think that homeownership is something that they desire, like maybe our parents did, or did that downturn have an impact on them in terms of their perspective on on homeownership? And here's what we found out: that 73% uh, of millennials and 44% of Wisconsinites of all ages, 18 and above, plan to purchase a home in the next five years. Big number. And then in Milwaukee, it increased to 52%. So more than half of everybody 18 plus that we surveyed said, we plan to buy a home in the next five years. Might be a second home, might be a first home as it was for 14% in that survey. So 14% of those were first time home buyers. And here's the reasons they said that they want to buy a home, whether they own one today or they want to make a move up. It's all about that place to call their own. You guys know how that is. You sit in that closing with that home buyer that's just closing on their first home, and it's, it's a dream, right? It's mine. I own it. 72% uh, said long-term investment. So even though there was a downturn, I think what they recognize is a home isn't a place to kind of buy and flip and sell. A home is a place to hold on for a long-term investment, and, and over those years, you will see a great return. And then uh, the third top reason was their freedom to remodel. So if it's those first-time home buyers that are in an apartment, they can't fix it up and put their own spin on it. So I thought you guys would find that interesting. I think it's really promising. It says a lot about our market and, and your business and what you're in for. So. Um, let me just say that, that, again, you're in for a real treat with Mark. He's walked in your shoes. He's going to do a presentation today about getting the listing. And I think there'll be many things you can take notes on and, and go back to your office today and implement right away, which is the other key thing we found with Mark. It's not a lot of things that are just kind of uh, good thoughts. They're key things that you can, you can take back and execute today. So again, thank you for being here. Please put your hands together and help me in welcoming Mark Leader. Thought it said no, but it really said on. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Lori, I want to thank you for that introduction. It wasn't the longest one, but it wasn't the shortest one I've ever had either. So, so how you doing, gang? Come on, give me a real great. How you doing? Great. You know, I um, I thought about something when I uh, when I landed here last night and I got into my hotel. So I'm going to go off script just for a minute. May I? You know, I wish the rest of the world could be like you folks here in Milwaukee. I really do. I really do. Um, you know, I came off the plane last night and uh, typical travel. You know, we're supposed to fly out of Toronto at 6 o'clock. We don't leave till 8.30. And uh, as our thank you, they're going to give us a free pop but charge us for the peanuts today. Um, and, uh, you, 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 you know, it's all part of the business. It's all part of the business. It's like working sometimes Sunday afternoons for you when you're with family. You know, you just got to do things that you got to do sometimes. 
And um, so you get on the plane and you read the paper, which, you know, is always positive news today, isn't it? You know, uh, you want to bum out your day, pick up the USA today or the Globe and Mail in Canada. But uh, um, <clears throat> when I come off the airplane here and I'm coming through your airport, there's a gentleman right there greeting you, saying, welcome to our city, welcome to our state. And I just think, you know, um, if only the rest of the world, even the rest of North America could pick up on that, how a kind word, a gesture, a thank you, I appreciate you. Wouldn't that be, make it just so much nicer every day for us, gang? Yes? So let's do this. Let's start off with something unique and, and unusual. Turn to the person beside you and say, good morning and thank you for being here with me. Now turn to the person in the opposite direction and say goodbye. <laughs> and the reason, I, the reason I asked you to greet them and say good morning, because I've always believed, you know, there's a couple of words that we need to use more often. We need to use please, thank you, I appreciate you, and of course the big one that I believe we should say at least five times a day to the ones that are closest to us, I love you. Yes? And the reason I asked you to say goodbye is because if we don't change a little bit over the next hour and a half that we're together, meaning that if I don't get a little better at delivering a message, if you don't get a little better at going out at your cho chosen profession, in other words, making an above average income in the real estate industry, our time wouldn't be worthwhile. How many would agree with that? Give me a yeah, man. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bust my butt and give you everything I can in the time we've got. So let me start off with sharing, you what, with sharing with you what my objectives are for today's presentation. I actually have four objectives all together. How many, please? Four. Yeah, my first one is I want us to have some fun. You know, I need some fun right now in my life. I'm on the road speaking, training, traveling, doing some consulting work. Um, from about last September 15th, my office shared with me a couple of weeks ago that I've done over 100 hundred presentations, I guess, in that time, and most of them are in a different city each week. And, 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 and I have to tell you something, gang, before we get started. Um, when I talk about having some fun, I have to share with you that I get really nervous when I have to public speak. Anyone else in the room gets nervous when you have to public speak? In fact, you know what they say the three greatest fears of mankind is? They say the first one, believe it or not, is public speaking. The second one is death. Can you feel that? Public speaking's number one. <laughs> death is two. And you know what the third one they say is? Dying while you're up here public speaking. <laughs> but there's a couple of things I've always done that's made me feel a little more comfortable. Um, can I share it with you just quickly? Well, the first one is I always say a short prayer in my room before I come to a presentation. I ask for some help. Um, uh, maybe I won't mess up too much today, and who knows, maybe someone will learn something from the audience. Um, the second thing I always do is I call home to my wife, Denise. Uh, we've been happily married now 25 years. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's great out of 27, yes? <laughs> and when I called home this morning and I talked to her, I said, hey, babe, how you doing? She says, good. She says, how you doing? I said, I'm really nervous. She says, what do you have to be nervous for? I mean, this is your 20th year. You've been out doing this over 100 cities a year. I, I, I mean, you know, and, and I said, no, you don't understand. I'm doing work for BMO Harris. And along with that, I've got some of the most respected real estate organizations in this neck of the woods that have come out. We got the folks from Shore West. Give them a round of applause. Great company. Of course, we got the folks from Homestead. And I got to point out uh, my friend who brought in 72 listings already this year, and he says that he had a lot to do with the last time he was out with us. So congratulations. <laughs> We're going to get you up to 200 listings this year, my friend, even if I got to come out and, and, and chauffeur for you from car to car. We got the folks from Remax, and I'm so happy and, and, uh, that God has blessed Dave Linegar to get stronger and healthier again because he's a great man in the industry. Where are the Remax folks? Give them a round of applause for being here. 
And of course, the Coldwell Banker folks, I can't thank them enough, one of the greatest organizations in North America. And I can't thank um, Amy and Lori and Dave and your whole group for having me here. So one last time, give them a round of applause. <laughs> so I said to Denise, she says, what do you got to be nervous about? I said, I'm talking to these great folks. She says to me, listen, honey, don't worry. The audience is going to be awesome today. Boy, that's a vote of confidence for me, isn't it? When I landed last night in the city, I um, call home and I like to check on my boys. My, I've got two boys. Uh, my oldest son is, is uh, Lucas Stone. And uh, he's really, really uh, the pride of my life. Um, wonderful, wonderful young man. And he's going to have such a great uh, future ahead of him. And he, he just told me last week, so if I get a little, what's that saying for Mux a little bit? He says to me, Dad, he said, I finally figured out what I want to do in life. And I said, what's that? And he says, I want to help people like you. He says, I'm going to go get my real estate license. So I took him down, and we signed him up, and he's going to start the journey, and, uh, uh, which is kind of nice. And my younger son, Jacob Nathan, was born in this world at one pound, 12 ounces. He's our miracle baby. And uh, the moms could appreciate that. But he's about 130 pounds today, and he's got an attitude like his mother, so he's just awesome, just <laughs> absolutely awesome. So when I landed, I called home to see how Denise and the boys were doing. I said, hey, hon, what's going on, and what did you guys do? And she said, well, you know, we had a bite to eat, and then um, we decided to go up to the mall and do a little shopping, keep things interesting. You always ask, well, what did you get? And she says, well, I picked up a few things for the house, and uh, the boys went into the guest store, and they bought themselves a couple new pairs of jeans. And I said, well, that sounds good. She says, yeah. And she says, by the way, I bought the family three white mice. And I said, three white mice. I said, honey, three white mice. Now, you got to picture something. I got the big house and the mortgage that goes with it. I got the two kids, the two car payments. You know, I got a dog that I spend more money on medication each month on the dog than the whole family included. Um, so I'm thinking to myself, what do I need three white mice in my life for? So I said to her, honey, why would you buy us three white mice? She says, well, actually, I bought three white mice, two males and one female. So now she's got me really interested. I said, honey, why would you buy us three white mice, two males and one female? She said, in case one of the males travels a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm with you guys today, and I'm catching that 615 home tonight, yes? Yeah, so what's our first objective here today is we're going to have some what? Fun. Yeah, my second objective here today is I want to challenge you. And I want to challenge you to go out and take advantage of an opportunity that I've seen come along maybe two, three times in my 30 years now I've been in the real estate business. You know, five years ago, as I was traveling around North America, if you go back seven years ago and uh, training my Leader's Choice program and working with some of the most successful salespeople in North America, I started to convey a message to the sales industry. And um, to be honest with you, gang, the message actually started to cost me business. But I had to stick with my convictions. In other words, I've always believed that it's better to tell you what you need to hear than what you want to hear. How many buy into that? Give me a yeah, man. So about seven years ago, I was traveling around, and, and I even had companies say to me, Mark, you know, the last time we had you in, you said some things that maybe we're not so comfortable with, and, and I don't think we're going to, and, 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 and can I tell you what the message was seven years ago, yes or no? Yes. There's a storm coming, gang. There's a storm coming. And understand that, understand that what goes up's got to come what? Right, and there's an old saying, seven feasts, seven years of feast, and seven years of what? Right, now, now those numbers are a little messed up today. It's not quite that cyclical as what it used to be. But I had companies say to me, you know, Mark, you got to come into these events, and you got to pump those salespeople up, and we need them, we need them in the debt up to here, and I, uh, up to here because they'll get up every day, and we need them to want bigger cars and bigger houses and sell bigger cars and bigger houses. And I said to them, well, dead up to here is no good. You're going to drown. Dead up to here is okay because it gives us a reason to get up and get at it. But the truth of the matter is we want to teach people. We want people to build a career, not be in a market. How many would buy into that? Give me a yeah, man. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a market. It's a career. And I've been eating, sleeping, and drinking this thing called real estate now. This is going to be my 30th year coming up or, or 29th year. And there ain't many folks you're going to meet at the age of 48, 49 years old that's made a living in the real estate industry for three decades. And I'm going to share with you what I was saying to them. I was saying to the agents, it's time to buckle down. 
It's time to make sure you put away a buck for a rainy day. It's time to get your house in order. Well, that perfect storm hit, and we seen the outcome of it, yes or no? And, 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 and now we've got another storm of brewing, brewing. But I don't think it's a storm. Um, I, and, I, and I hate to use the word storm even. I hate to even use the word tsunami because th those have negative connotations. And it's not a negative connotation I'm trying to share with you here. We've got the perfect market run that has started. The perfect market run that has started. And if you're new into the business, then you've stepped into it at the right time. If you've been in the business a while, congratulations, because I'm going to tell you what, gang, I have never seen the stars line up the way they are lining up now. And, you know, um, I've had people say to me, you know, Mark, uh, you may be the number one speaker in the real estate industry today, and the truth of the matter is I don't ever want to be number one. I want to be number three forever, because then I can have something to chase. But along with that... I am probably the one person that has, does more one-day speaking engagements than anybody else out in the industry because most of the people in my business go to a three-day event. You don't hear from them again for six or eight months. Do you follow me? I'm booked every day, different city. I work with every major real estate organization across North America, and I train for 70 of the top 100 independents. Uh, as I speak, there's trainers that are training my material across North America. And I tell you this stuff not to do this, but to build credibility with you because when I seen the number of hands go up that this is the first time you've been with me, I mean, I, 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 I mean, if you don't buy into that I've been where you're going, then why would you listen to where I want to take you? Are you with me on that one? Give me a yeah, man. So, so, so my real estate career spans 29 years. My first year I earned less than $9,000. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I was at an event, something like this. It was in Toronto, downtown. There was four or 500 people up uh, in the audience. And I'll tell you what, man, I had only made nine grand the year before. And in the words of Les Brown, I was hungry. I was hungry. See, I thought I knew sales. I grew up, my father had a clothing store. I was selling women's apparel at nine, 10 years old. My mother had pizza parlors. So I was doing that. And the, when I was in high school, I opened myself a little country uh, and Western music and tape business at the local, seed, uh, local flea market. I mean, I knocked on doors, sold aluminum for my uncle door to door. I mean, I had sold, I've been selling since I was probably almost couldn't walk. And I thought, this is a walk in the park. I know half of the town. I like people. Heck, I'm going to make a gazillion dollars. And it wasn't working out that way. It wasn't working out that way. And I was at an event similar to this, and there was a man up on stage, and he looked out on the audience, and he said, one of you has greatness in you. And I felt like he was talking to me. You follow me? Felt like he was talking to me. But this couldn't be. I mean, I just went through. I, I, I mean, I, 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 to, to stay where I was, I borrowed money from my ex-girlfriend's parents. My parents said they wouldn't give me any more money. Said they'd give me breakfast or lunch if I needed it, but don't come looking for it. If you follow me, I cashed it. I mean, I, someone's got greatness in you. And I felt like he was talking to me. And I, can I tell you some words that fundamentally changed my career, which changed my life? And over the next 28 years, 28 years, I have never had a year where I've generated less than a six-figure income, and many years that I've crossed into the seven. Can I share with you the words that was the catalyst for that to happen for me in my life, yes or no? He said this, one of you has greatness in you, I've shared that already with you, but there's a good chance it will never come out unless you listen to what I'm about to say, and that is this. The teacher will appear when the student is ready to learn. The teacher will appear when the student is ready to learn. Let me say it one more time. The teacher will appear when the student is ready to learn. And I'm going to tell you what, man, I was ready. I was hungry. And here's what I've learned over the last 28 years since then. It wasn't an age thing. It wasn't an age thing. You could, you could be ready to learn at 60 just as well as 16. But I was ready. And I was ready. And he said that, and I'm going to teach you exactly what you need to know in order to be successful. 
So, but the thing is, gang, is I don't want you to think that I'm one of these guys that thinks he knows everything about everything. You want to teach me how to be a better husband? I need that help. You want to teach me how to be a better father? I need that help. You want to teach me how to be a, a, a better financial planner and all that stuff? I need that help. But if you're looking to learn real estate and you're looking to, be, to master the business of real estate, and if you're looking to generate an above average income in less time and have more fun, then you've made the right decision to be here today because I'm going to teach you everything that I need, every, teach you everything that I can in the time that we've got. But going back to my second point, the only way any of it will be good for you is if you what? Apply it. So write this statement down. Education without application is worse than worthless. Education without application is worse than worthless. And if you want to get the most of the time we're together, you've got to give a little bit of blind what? Faith. So I challenge you to take what I'm going to share with you today. And I challenge you to go out and take advantage of this perfect market that's upon us. We got house prices that drop to all-time low, but are on their way back up. That's a positive sign. If you're going to buy, better to pay 10% more in a rising market than trying to get to the bottom and it falls further. Are you with me on that one, yes or no? So we got a rising market. Every major country around the world is talking low interest rates for an extended period of time because of the debt the public is carrying. The Canadian government yesterday literally came out with a bold statement that we expect the interest rates of 1% or less on our prime to be here for the foreseeable future, and we are going to a neutral interest rate policy. Now, what that means is they're not preaching that rates are on their way back up again. Are you with me on that, yes or no? So we got low interest rates, we've got low housing costs, we got unemployment starting to come back. You tell me what, that that is not the perfect recipe for success in the real estate industry. But here's the thing, not everybody's going to grab it. Not everybody's going to grab a hold of this opportunity, because like every other opportunity in life, it can be very fleeting. We think it's here, we think we got time, and then it's what? gone. So I want to challenge you today to go out and make the most of this opportunity. My third objective to be with you today is I want to join forces with you to help you make your real estate dreams come true. And my fourth objective, if you'll um, allow me to, is that even if we never see each other again, even if you never hear the words Mark Leader, you never hear the words Leader's Choice or some of the different programs I've created that are out in the marketplace. I want to teach you some stuff today that I'll guarantee you, if you do what I'm going to share with you, you will truly go out and generate whatever income you want to choose. If I can accomplish that, gang, if I can teach you how to make more money, teach you how to do it in less time and have more fun while you're doing it, would our time together be successful, yes or no? <laughs> Give me a real, yeah, man. All right, then let's do this. Pick up a pen, find yourself a sheet of paper, and let's turn this into a real estate seminar. And when we are talking, when we are talking about making more money and doing it in less time, um, there's seven things I'm going to share with you, gang. Seven things that I'm going to share with you. The first one is, in order to be successful in the real estate business, you got to understand that it's not a complicated business you got to not make it complicated. In fact, one of the things I hear from my students over and over and over again that take the Leader's Choice program, in fact, I just put 100 people through it myself in Detroit, Michigan. You want to talk about a struggling part of the world. Are you with me there, yes or no? Flint, Michigan, I had 100 salespeople take the program with me. And when you count just listing sales and listings sold during a nine-week period, those 100 salespeople did 1,500 transactions. How many people would say that's a pretty good number? 750 listings brought in in nine weeks. That's a pretty good number. And if they can do it in Detroit, we can do it anywhere. Am I right or wrong? And I said to them right from the start, if there's one thing I hear from the salespeople that take training with me is that, Mark, you take the complicated and make it simple. Well, the truth of the matter is, that's what our job is. Your job is to take the
the complexity of the home sale and make it simple for the common man to understand. My job as a trainer is to take the complexity of the real estate industry where all of these people want to make it sound more complicated than what it is, but the truth of the matter is there's a hidden agenda with those folks. And the hidden agenda is, is that if we make it complicated, then you think you need me. Are you with me there? Give me a yeah, man. But you see, my job here today is to have you never need me. Because the truth of the matter is, you came here with your old stuff. You're going to get to network with some other people in the group, so you're going to get their stuff. I'm going to give you my stuff. Over the next hour and a half, you guys are getting stuffed. <laughs> But the truth is, you should know more than I do. Because you came with your stuff, you got their stuff, plus my stuff, you got more stuff now than I got stuff. And my stuff, though, is going to help you make more money. And that is, I need you to make the business simple. I need you to quit thinking less and doing more. And understand that success in the real estate business, in order for us to accomplish what you want to accomplish, is we need to get back to the basics. We need to get back to the basics. We got to stop listening to all those pundits that couldn't do it, so they're going to teach you versus the ones that did do it. Now, don't get me wrong when I say this to you. You're going to hear better speakers in the real estate industry than you're ever going to hear with Mark Leader. You're going to hear more eloquent speakers. They're going to be funnier. They're going to, and all of those things. But you know why I'm here? Because I'm not a, 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 a teacher because I couldn't. I'm a teacher or speaker because I did. Are you with me there, yes or no? And I'm not trained to be a speaker. I'm just going to open my heart up and put it on my sleeve. That's what I'm going to do. And when I tell you that, the real estate business is not a complicated business. Oh, there's some complexities to it, but the system works those complexities through. What I'm talking about is success in the real estate business isn't complicated. It isn't complicated. And the quicker you come to terms that when you simplicity, when you simplify what you're doing, you then can master it. I'll give you an example of this for any naysayers in the audience. What is the most successful franchise ever created in the history of man? McDonald's. And yet you go into a McDonald's and they can be run by 14-year-olds. Am I right or wrong? But yet... There's grown adults, could be 30, 40, 50 years old, worked at other restaurants, decide that they're going to open their own burger joint somewhere, and you can talk to the bankers, but generally speaking, most restaurants fail, 92% of them fail within three to five years. Most of them fail even quicker than that. Why is McDonald's so successful? Because they took the complicated and made it what? Simple. And when you can make it simple, then you can do it over and over and over again. And the more you do it, the better you get. The better you get, the higher results are achieved. So when we're talking about getting back to the basics, the first thing is, is that you got to have an awareness. you got to have an awareness, gang, that we are in the business of listing real estate. Oh, many of you may have got a license thinking I'm going in the business of selling houses, selling commercial property, selling farmland. But I'm going to tell you what, if we keep doing what others do, we will keep getting what others get. And according to the National Association of Realtors, there will be about 5 million transactions this year with over a million licenses. That means that the average agent will do about five deals. Now you take the top 20% out of the equation, which takes in 80% of the business, that means that approximately 200,000 agents will do 4 million of the transactions. That will mean 800,000 will be shared by, by uh, anyhow, you get it. <laughs> so if we keep doing what the 80% keep doing, we're going to keep getting what they get. Am I right or wrong? We got to be different. We got to be part of that 20% that does the 80, 10% that does the 90. And that 10% that does the 90%, they understand either someone taught them early on or they were blessed with a gene that figured this out that we are not in the business of selling houses. We are in the business of listing properties for sale. So the first awareness you've got to have is that listings are the way to the top. Always have been, always will be, that will never change. The second awareness is, is you got to buy into, if it is to be, it's up to me. You know, I named a bunch of great organizations um, 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 at the start 
of the, of the, uh, of the presentation. But the truth of the matter is, gang, there's no organization that's going to make you successful in the real estate business. Oh, they will support you, give you the tools and the teachings and all that stuff. But ultimately, you got to buy into if it is to be, it's up to who? Me. Say it with me. If it is to be, it is up to me. So listings are the way to the top. If it is to be, it's up to me. you got to buy into if anybody can, I can. Say it with me. If anybody can, I can. And you got to walk in on those listing appointments with this attitude. And the attitude is, I'm going in to see if I want it. And if I want it, I am going to take it. You see, most salespeople walk in with this attitude. Boy, I hope they're nice people. God, I hope they need to sell. No, you see a top producer, a lister, they walk in with the attitude that I'm going in to see if I want this one because if I don't want it, I'm not going to tie myself up. I got two, three, four more appointments coming down the pipe. So I ain't just putting my sign up anywhere. I'm going in to see if I want it, and if I want it, I'm going to take it. So you got to have that awareness. After you create the awareness, you got to understand that success in any commission business has to start off with having some goals. And when we talk about having some goals, they got to be smart goals, gang. They got to be smart goals. Now, we've all heard people talk about goals, but why does Mark Leaders start off with SMART goals? Because the SMART is an acronym. And if you always remember the S-M-A-R-T, then you're going to have everything you need to put together a goal. See, a lot of us say, well, here's what my goal is for the year. Well, what components have you got to make that goal a reality? See, the SMART stands for this. Your goal's got to start off to be specific. That's a big problem in the sales business. I know. I owned a real estate company from the age of 22 to 30. I bought it with 18 salespeople. Three weeks later, I was left with three. Myself, my partner, who was my brother, and a retired accountant. Well, because all those other 15 people said they wouldn't work for a 20-year-old, we're 50 years old. What does he know about being? Over the next eight years, we built it up to 65, 70 salespeople, whatever it was. We had 25% market share with less than 10% of the people on the board. Did we turn it around, yes or no? And the one thing I can tell you is that we did monthlies with our salespeople and then quarterly reviews, along with our office meeting and in-house training. You see, we had a saying at our organization, you will be successful or I will fire you. <laughs> oh, don't get me wrong, it's not that, I, not that I don't like you. You see, if I liked you, if I loved you, I wouldn't keep you around. See, if I cared about you, why would I allow you to not be successful? If I really cared about you, wouldn't I say to you, listen, I don't think real estate's for you. I've tried everything, given you everything possible. You're still not doing it. So you should go out and get a job that will bring your family in a steady income. Am I right or wrong? But to allow salespeople to come in and drink coffee and hang around and socialize and all of that, I ain't doing anybody any favors by being a buddy. We need a boss. We need a boss. Whether you recognize it or not, you don't want to work for a buddy. You want to work for a boss. Now, if you work for a buddy, then you need to hire a coach who's not going to be your buddy. It's going to make sure he's your boss. Either one is okay. You may get the best of the both worlds that way. And if you're interested in finding out more about coaching, give me your business card, and I'll give you 30 days free for just being here today, which is a seven, dollars $800 value. If you're interested in taking advantage of that, I'd like to extend that to you. So before you leave, give me your business card, write coaching on the back, and I'll have someone contact you, and you can explore. That's pretty good for being here, isn't it? You just got $700 worth of stuff. How's that, Lori? That wasn't planned either, was it? So you're going to have to talk to my office and say, what the hell is he doing? Okay, Lori, if he goes down that direction, I want you to pull out that sheep's herder hook or whatever and drag him off. But you know what? I've always believed that we get by giving. The more people we help, the more help we are given. So I always said to the salespeople this, I can teach you how to be successful, but it's not my responsibility for your success. You follow me on that? Okay, I can teach you how to do that. So your goal has to be specific. In all those interviews, if I had a salesperson say to me, oh, over the next month, I'd like to get four, maybe five, six listings. I can tell you they're lucky to get two because it wasn't specific. 
I need to say to you in the next 30 days, how many listings are you going to bring in? And you're going to look me square in the eye and say, I'm bringing six in. Not eight, not four, six. And I'm going to tell you what, when you shoot for six, you're probably bringing eight because the momentum will take you further than what the goal is. Are you with me there, yes or no? But I need you to have that laser. It's going to be six listings this month. Your goal needs to be measurable. And the only thing you can measure success on in the real estate industry is by the number of signs you got up out in your neck of the woods. Okay, You only measure success based on the number of listings you bring in. Don't ever count the money. When you start to count the money, your business will go off track. Or I'm not suggesting that I can't show you if you're bringing this many listings a year and this many sales, this is what you're going to, but focus on building the inventory. Like Kevin Costner said to us in the field of dreams, if you build it, they will what? Come. Your A, the A then has, stands for attainable. Attainable. Your goal has to be a stretch, but not an impossibility. It has to be, if, because if you keep setting goals for yourself that you don't achieve, then the future goals you set for yourself will not mean anything to you. So you need to have your goal to be a stretch, but not an impossibility. The R then stands for reward. You need to come up with little rewards for yourself. It could be that if I get my three appointments this week and I bring in my one listing, I'm taking Friday afternoon off. I'm going to go to the beach. I'm going to go to the spa. I'm going to hang around the house. Heck, I may just run a big old bubble bath and put my CD in. Maybe I have a glass of wine. Who knows? If anybody's watch, not watching, I may sneak out in the backyard and have a smoke. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting you skip off, drink wine, and smoke. That's not what I'm suggesting to you. But what I am suggesting to you is this, is you need to have little rewards. Are you with me on that, yes or no? Little things, little things. And then T in the SMART stands for track. You need to track yourself on a daily basis. At the end of every day, you got to look yourself in the mirror. And you got to ask yourself this. Did I do the activities that achieve success? Or did I just hang out for the day and do a bunch of low-income, busy activities? What do you think 80% of the people do in the industry? And I ain't knocking the industry, but let's call it way, the way it is. They show up late. They leave early. They have two-hour lunches. Am I right or wrong? And then they wonder why they're not doing any business. See, there's a way to run a business, gang. And if I ask the majority of salespeople, are you a business person? I say, heck yeah. I say, okay. Then tell me exactly what were your activities yesterday that drove you to make money? And how much money have you made in the last five days? You see, at the end of every shift, companies run off a sales sheet. Am I right or wrong? How many burgers did we sell? How many fries? How many Cokes? They run books, daily, weekly basis, look at their goals monthly. We don't do that in the real estate industry. I, I shouldn't say we. Generally speaking, they don't. I've been doing this long enough. Then in November, the real estate industry sets a whole bunch of goals for the next year. They put it in a file. They look at it again in November, and they go, holy cow, I wanted to do 250000 this year. I'm at ninety. I got 60 days to go. I guess I better pick it up a little bit. Am I right or wrong? So we need to track ourselves on a regular basis. That's the components of a goal. Along with setting smart goals, that after you set your goal, you got to make a commitment towards your success. And if you looked in the dictionary under commitment, it is going to say three things. It's going to say, number one, is you're going to pledge. You have to make a pledge. Now, when I was in school, we pledged allegiance to the queen. We did our Lord's Prayer, which personally I believe the prayer should be back in our school systems. But anyhow, that's a different conversation for a different day. Um, um, we sung O Canada, so we pledged allegiance to our country, which I thought started the day off on a, on a, on a uh, 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 what's the right word, respect of the things that we have. So you got to start off with your pledge. Now in the real estate business, what are we pledging to achieve? Well, you're pledging to achieve your goals. The second word under commitment says to entrust. And what are we going to entrust to? And I need you to write this sucker down. And as you write it down, it's got to leave that paper, travel up that arm, and get tattooed right here on the brain. And that is this. You need to entrust that if you do the daily activities, leave the end result up to the higher power. 
whatever that higher power might be to you. You see, let me share something with you. Um, look at me for a second. I know you're writing, but look at me for a second. How many people have ever planted a garden, have ever planted a garden or worked with somebody that's done planting of gardens? Give me a show of hands. Could be mom you've helped or dad when you were younger. Now, in order to grow a garden, you've got to have some blind faith. I'll give you a very quick story. Husband and wife after dinner one night are out for a walk, having a cup of tea, settling their stomach. And they pass this house in the neighborhood. And um, they stop and they're looking at it. And of course, we all know that women are far more intelligent than men. I mean, think about this for a second. Father, time, mother, nature, which is more important in the scheme of things, <laughs> right? And the husband looks at the wife and says to her this, says, honey, look at that garden. God has blessed that family with such a beautiful garden. And the wife turns and says to the husband, no, dear, God has blessed that family with somebody who wants to create a beautiful garden. See, picture something for a minute. You want to plant a garden in the spring. We've got this patch of grass in front of our house. We pull out the grass. We turn the soil. We put some fertilizer in. We drop some seeds in. We put some dirt over top. We sprinkle it with water. We water it with love. That night our back hurts. We got all these muscles we haven't used for a year. Am I right or wrong? Okay. And then we take a step back. And what's the first thing that comes out of that garden? Weeds. What's the first thing that comes out of a realtor's mind if it doesn't go exactly the way it's supposed to go? Weeds. The market's tough. My broker isn't helping me. Am I right or wrong? Okay? But we pull those weeds. We sprinkle it with fertilizer. We water it with love. We take a step back and weeds come out again. We pull those weeds. We See, all of that's got to be done by blind faith. Because all of a sudden, it could be two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. I'm not a gardener. I, I, I was blessed with a wife that loves to create beautiful gardens. That's good enough for me. Um, um, but the truth is, we take a step back. And all of a sudden, the higher power has blessed us with a beautiful garden. It could be flowers that bring love and joy to your house. You want to increase the, the love and joy in your house? Put some fresh flowers on the kitchen table at the entranceway to your house. Um, it could supply us with fruit and vegetables to feed ourselves. Am I right or wrong? Well, if you didn't have blind faith, if you didn't do certain activities every day, proven activities through, the, through time, we would never plant a garden. We never plant a garden. We never harvest a feast. Does that make sense to you, yes or no? So you need to have, you need to entrust that there is certain activities in the real estate industry that have proven to be successful. And if you do those activities and you do them enough and you keep them simple and you do it over and over and over again, then you become confident, competent, and natural at what you do. When you become competent, confident, and natural at what you do, then you start to bring in anything that you choose. That's what masters do. That's what masters do. They can literally generate any income they choose to generate. You know, my son Lucas, I told you, he's going to get into the real estate business, and I'm so proud of my son. And, 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 and he says to me, Dad, but the one thing I'm worried about is this, is all of my friends say, why would you do that? You want a job with a steady paycheck. You know, you want to, you want to get a job, and at what, you, you, you get the idea where that seed's been planted. Am I right or wrong? It's very hard to make a living in the real estate. You have ups and downs. And, and he says, Dad, what, what, what is about that? I said, well, son... There's probably some truth to that for the majority of people that come into the real estate business because no one ever shared with them that there's certain things you've got to do to be successful. And when you do these things and you do it over and over and over again, then you can literally generate whatever income you choose, whatever income you choose. That's the industry you are in. If you want to make 30 grand a year, you can do it. If you want to make two, three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars a year, you can do it. So you see, but there's certain activities you got to do, and you got to do them over and over and over again, and you got to have blind faith. And at the end of each day, if you did these activities, leave the end result up to the higher power, and it will deliver for you.
So you pledge, you entrust, you will naturally perform. And when we're naturally performing, I want to teach you the formula for success in the real estate business. And if you always build your business based off of these four principles, everything else will come together for you. If I could, if I could give you a formula for success that I don't care what marketplace you're in. Remember, Mark Leader don't teach for a market. I teach for a career. I don't create, create salespeople. I create business people. I create people that no matter what is thrown at you, I will give you the goal and the skills necessary to accomplish that. I mean, think about something for a minute. I'm not bragging. But if you thought a four or five years ago was tough in the real estate industry, try making a living speaking in the real estate industry. <laughs> try making a living training in the real estate industry. Are you with me? 85% of my competitors were wiped out. You know how many number ones I've seen come along that tells you you got the next silver bullet? You with me? And, and there is no silver bullets. There is no silver bullets. But there are certain things that you got to do. For example, this formula for success, I will guarantee you, no matter what the economy throws you. Remember, I started at 18% interest rates. My first house I sold was an 18% first and a 21% second. And I've also sold at the lowest parts of the interest rates. So here's, if I could give you this formula, how many would want it? Give me a show of hands. Give me a show, okay. Then here's the first thing. Part one to the four-part formula for success. Part one is you must bring in one saleable listing a week. Write that down. Now watch how these numbers work. We bring in 52 listings a year if we bring in one listing a week. Yes or no, gang? And let's just assume out of those 52, heck, let's do 50 because you're going to take a couple of weeks off at least. So out of those 50 listings, no matter how hot the market is, let's just assume that one out of two sells. So that's 25 sell. Now, in this neck of the woods, what could we use as an average sale price? Could we use 200000 Okay, and I know commissions are negotiable. Everyone say that to me so I can get that disclosure out of the way. Commissions are negotiable. Okay, and, but could we say that the average commission, if I looked in the MLS, is at 5%, 6%, 7% market? Just generally speaking, not what you charge, just generally speaking. Six, okay, so on 200000 at 6%, that's twelve grand, and the listing side then would be half, would be six. So let's take that 25 and let's times it by $6,000. Heck, that's 120. That's $150,000 right there. And what did we do to generate $150,000, gang? Brought in one listing a week. Say it with me. One listing a week. Now, these people, these 25, they got no place to live. So they're probably going to buy from you again. But let's just assume only half buy. And let's just, instead of 12.5, let's use 12. It'll make the number easier. So we take 12 times $6,000. That's another 72. Now we're at $222,000. I don't know about you guys, but when the average family in North America makes fifty or $60,000 a year with two people working 35 to 40 hours a week, the man telling them when they can come and go when their holidays are going to be. I don't care whether you work for one of the big multinationals and you got a career for 30 years with them. They're also going to tell you your lifestyle of retirement. Am I right or wrong? Okay? And we can generate $222,000. And all we got to do is bring in a listing a week. And only half of them got to sell. And only half of them got to buy from you again. Tell me you can't get excited about that opportunity. But let's assume that this guy in the striped suit's full of crap, and only half of what I'm going to share with you is true. Let's cut it in half again, and it was $111,000. That's pretty good dough, am I right or wrong? And that would be half of half of half, and we have to get $111,000. That's still twice the average income, and you can pick and choose your own hours, come and go as you please. You can truly be in control of your own destiny and future. You know, I said to my son, Lucas, this. I said, you know what, Luke? You could go get a job with one of the Fortune 500 companies, and you will have less security in life than if you create your own future. And he looked at me, he says, Dad, but all my friends... And I said, no, no, okay? If we keep doing what others do, we're going to keep getting what others get. 
and it crossed the Rust Belt of North America. You know how many 55-year-old 50, men, 45-year-old women that gave companies 20 and 30 years of their life that one day they just said, sorry, we're moving the factory to China. Am I right or wrong? I got relatives that happened too. And for years they bragged, oh, you got to work at Chrysler. Oh, yeah, we get paid this and I get paid that and I got this and I got that and hey, you got to work on Sundays. Ah, you, know, you, you. you follow me? And I'm going to tell you what. If they didn't have a plan B, some of them are in big trouble. Okay? The rust belt was wiped out. Am I right or wrong? But when you can go out every day and plant and grow your own prosperity, then now you truly have control of your future. Along with that, gang, this is a side note. Take 10% of your gross revenue and put it away in savings. You never have to worry about investing. If you put 10% away, you will always be looked after in retirement. And let's face it, if you can't live off 90% of your income, you're probably living past your means. Am I right or wrong? And the earlier you can do that. Now, if you want to read a book about that rule, there's a book that came out a number of years ago called The Wealthy Barber. It is a very good read. It's a very simple read, and it's a great read. So The Wealthy Barber. So the formula for success, we got to bring in a listing a week. Part two to the formula, part two to the formula is you must bring in a formula listing each week. Part two is separate the looker from the buyer. We stay in touch with lookers, we work buyers. Now, I want to give you a formula that I'll guarantee you within five minutes you will be able to determine whether these people are lookers or they are buyers. If I could do that for you, would that be helpful? Yes? Okay. Well, a buyer's got three components. And if they don't have these three components, they are lookers, not buyers. The first component is they must have mucho dineros, greenbacks pesos, Canadian dollars, call it whatever you want, okay? When it's said and done, gang, your, your job is to find people that have money. Business is done with people that have money. Oh, oh, that shows what he knows. We can sell people houses with no money down. Yeah, I know that, but it'll cost you a whole bunch more what? Time. And time is what? Absolutely. Time is money. So they got to have money. They've got to have motivation. And they've got to have urgency. If they don't have those three things, then they are lookers, not buyers. They can have all the money in the world and motivation. But if there is no urgency, they are lookers, not buyers. Now, let me ask you something. Where do we find people with money, motivation, and urgency? Anybody want to share? I can tell you exactly right now where to find people with money, motivation, and urgency. Are you interested? Yes or no? Sell their house first. Am I right or wrong? Okay. Generally speaking, unless they haven't spent up the equity already by buying SUVs or toys or all that stuff, generally speaking, someone who owns a house that's buying and upgrading, they've built a little bit of what? Equity, which means they got money. They're motivated because they know where they want to go. And they got to be out in 60 days, 30 days. Are, is there urgency, yes or no? So say this with me. Listings are the name of the game. Say it with me. Right. So we bring in a listing each week. We separate the looker from the buyer. Third component is depending on your jurisdiction, always get your buyer agency agreement signed. If they are not prepared to sign agency with you, you don't work with them. It's as simple as that. It is simple as that. You either learn that rule here or learn it out on the street after you show somebody 16 houses and they call you with one of those dear Mark calls. You know, we left the office and there was an open house and we just dropped by and it was the perfect one. And, and my husband said to me that you always said you wanted the best for us and this was the best house and we'll tell everybody to use you even though we didn't. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Okay, so get your agency agreement signed and part four to the formula Show and sell your company inventory first. Show and sell your company inventory first. Show and sell your listings first. Show and sell in-house inventory first. You want to have easier showings. You want to set up showings easier, sell in-house. You want easier negotiations, sell in-house. You got a problem at closing, sell in-house. You'll be able to resolve those problems quicker. And if you resolve them quicker, means you make more money again in less what? Time. Part, the second point I want to share with you then is this. 
is number two, the future of real estate is going to be based on a term called social capital. Make no mistake about it. The future of real estate is based on social capital. Now, I wish I could tell you that I came up with this term because one of the things I've always believed in is to give credit where credit is due. And I've worked with some of the greatest trainers and the greatest speakers. When I was in the real estate industry, some of the best I've worked under. And whenever I'm teaching something they've taught me, I always share one way or another where the information, because it's the cycle of life, gang. I wish I could tell you I was struck by lightning one day and God blessed me with this stuff, but I became a good student. When that gentleman stood up on stage, his name was Floyd Wickman that day, and he said, the teacher will appear when the student is ready to learn. I was ready to learn. After that, I took Floyd's course, took Mike Ferry's courses. I took uh, Tommy Hopkins, Zig Ziglar, you name it, I took it all. And what I share with you is everything that I've learned from, from them and pass it on again. And when we talk about the term social capital, I think it's one of the terms that someday will go down that Mark Leader coined this phrase for the real estate industry. But to give credit where credit is due, the first time it was coined or expressed was back in 1912. And it was first brought to the forefront, the word, the best of my knowledge, and because Google knows everything, and I Googled it. Okay, was a, a university professor by the name of John Hannafin. It's actually L.J. Hannafin. And he was for, from Virginia. And he was doing a study, a thesis, a paper, on two businessmen in a, in a Midwest community. And the two businessmen sold the exact same widget. But one businessman was extremely successful. One just hobbled along. So he did a study on these two enterprises and why was one more successful than the other when they both sold the exact same widget in the exact same town. And what he came down to was this, is the man that was extremely successful selling that widget understood the true value of social capital. And when I was flying back one day from Las Vegas from a conference I was doing, and I was out of doing a... Uh, um, uh, speech for one, of the, for one of the franchises out there at their convention. There's two young bucks in the front row, and one young buck looks at the other young buck and says, boy, this guy, he's old school, man. Let's get out of here. And I'm thinking, old school? I haven't hit 50 yet, and you're already calling me old school. So it, so it bothered me greatly. So, I mean, I sat and I, I stewed on it on the plane and all that, and I thought, what's allowed me to have a 30-year career? What's allowed me to, even during the toughest time in the real estate industry, I wasn't booked 130 engagements a year, but I was still booked 80, 85 through the housing bubble. That's pretty good, wouldn't you agree? When you think about it, okay? Never cut my fees to do it either. So I was still, I, I mean, so, so, and I got thinking, well, what's allowed me to have this career? What allowed me to list over 1,000 properties during a 10-year period and average 93 closings a year for eight years consecutively? And we didn't use personal assistance in those days. What's allowed me to go out and, and do a couple thousand speaking engagements over the last 20 years, spoken at every major conference. I was just down in Atlantic City, did the keynote for Weikert. Uh, um, what's allowed me to do that? When I drill right down to it, what has allowed me to do it? And what has allowed me to do it is understanding the true value of social, which is the relationships that we have in the community and understanding the true value of those relationships. See, that's what social capital stands for. Social is society and the relationships that we've got. Capital is the true value of those relationships. See, you've got to understand that we are in a relationship-based business today more than ever. And there's something that has been coming down the pipe slowly over the last two or three years, but that snowball is picking up momentum. And in Wisconsin, you're like, Canadians, you understand the term snowball, right? Okay, especially after this winter, wouldn't you agree? Boy, I'll tell you what, we should have a baby boom coming up after this winter. Hey, wine sales, baby boom, and snowmobile repair is probably the, uh, anyhow. Um, um, like snowageddon. You either loved your spouse or you got divorced at the end of this winter. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> hey, you either fell in love again. Anyhow, so, so, and there's this thing coming down the pipe called agent ratings. And we're one of the last industries 
that have really had it come out. I can't tell you why, whether it's because we're segment, seg, such a seg, anyhow, business, okay? Um, um, that's the other, I had a speech impediment at the age of 15, so if I, 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 I skip sometimes, you'll, you'll get a handle on that. But, but, you know, the auto industry has had it, the hotel industry's had it, the restaurant business has had it. If you're going to New York City, Manhattan with your, with your loved one for the weekend and you're not there all the time, you might Google what are the 10 best restaurants in Manhattan and read the reviews. Am I right or wrong? Well, that's coming out now in the real estate industry. It's coming out and it's a third party, so it's not stopping. And the third party's going to use it to make money. They're going to sell ads beside your ratings. So understand, gang, when I tell you it's a relationship-based business, that is going to be more true leading forward. This day of hustling the deal, this day of the hardball closer, this day of treating people with poor customer service, that is over. The Internet will make sure of that, that we are now into a customer-centric business more than ever. And you need to leave here today with this philosophy that we have at Mark Leader Courses, and that is that this, is that you must treat the customer as if they feed, house, and clothe you. And when you treat the customer as if they feed, house, and clothe you, they will. When I worked in my father's clothing business, he taught me that rule. When I worked in my mother's pizza parlor, taught me that rule. I remember one time we were coming home and I got into a little bit of a dispute with a good customer in my father's clothing business. I'll tell you the story very quickly. And when we closed for the day, and this lady came into the shop on a regular basis. Her husband was an industrialist in town. She was good for two, three hundred dollar sale every time she came in. And that's when we're selling jeans for 15 bucks. You with me, gang? Levi's, the best at the time. for I mean, so that was a big customer. And Mrs. Weber and her husband came over to the new country with a dollar in, her po in their pocket, and they literally became millionaires. But she still lived like she only had a dollar in her pocket. And this one particular day, a 12-year-old, 13, 14-year-old Mark and her didn't hit see eye to eye, and she thought, I'm out of here. And she left. So when we were closing up shop that day, we were driving over to Danny Woods Hockey, his um, a hockey store. I need a new hockey stick. And my dad said, when we go in the store, he says, hey, before we go in, I've got to ask you something, son. I said, what's that? I said, who's buying this hockey stick for you? I said, I thought you were, Dad. And, uh, and he says, well, am I? Or is it Mrs. Weber? And he walked in. Being that age, I didn't think much of it. We're, we're now in the car. We're driving home. We're driving up Hugel Avenue. And he says, hey, what's your goal for this spring? I said, well, I'd sure like to get that dirt bike. He said, how are you making out saving? I said, pretty good. He says, who do you think is going to buy that dirt bike for you, son? I said, well, Dad, I thought I was going to save $300 and you were going to kick in $300. He said, well, maybe it's Mrs. Weber's buying you that bike, son. Starting to think a little more. Remember, I'm young, 13, 14 years old. We pull into the driveway at the house. And he says, hey, listen, before we go in the house, let me ask you a question. I said, what's that? Who's going to put the food on the table for us tonight? And I said, Mom is, Dad. I mean, she's, you know, she always gets mad at us if we don't come home for 6 o'clock. You know, you always blah, 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 blah. And, and he says, no, Mrs. Weber, your mom may prepare it. But Mark, understand something. When it's said and done, the customer feeds houses and clothes us. And no matter what Mrs. Weber said to you, because I know that she can be a difficult lady sometime, understand that Mrs. Weber feeds houses and clothes us. And the quicker you can learn that, if you're going to be a business person, no matter what your income is. And, you know, I used to get people in my real estate office, they couldn't believe it. I'd go out and I'd list a 25,000 teardown. And they'd say, I'm sure, I mean, with all the business, you're bringing in 100 listings this year, you handle a lot of the developers. Our average sale price on the board is 100,000, and you're popping off houses two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 on a regular basis. Why would you go deal with that? I say, Why? Because that's someone's home, and they've invited me in. And I don't care whether you make you live in a $30,000 home or a $3 million home. You never treat a rich friend better than a poor friend. You never treat an educated man better than an uneducated man. And understand, no matter what your income level is, when you take people and you raise them up around you, you have the servant relationship with them. They are the master, you are the servant. The master is he who pays, the servant is he who he who receives that payment? Are you with me on that? Yes or no? 
okay? And no matter what your income level is, I don't care what your education level is, if they're going to pay you, then we're there to serve. And when you start to understand the true value, all of a sudden, you don't need to show up with gifts at closing. You don't have to run around banging on people's doors asking them to send you referrals because the referrals will line up for you because they will get such an experience that they never have in our society today, and that is a true customer service experience. You see, I can teach you all dialogue technique and process, but if I don't pound into you that the true way to referral and relationship-based business is by treating people better than you would even expect to be treated. All of a sudden, they brag about you. They brag about you. Why is Ponderosa closed and Ruth Chris expanding? Why is Sears and J.C. Penney stores look like dumps and Nordstrom's are building stores now across Canada and started during the worst recession? Can J.C. Penney sell the same thing that Nordstrom can? The answer is what? Yes. But do their executives have the mentality of the Nordstrom executives? My answer to you would be what? No. No. No, they don't. They don't understand. They take advantage of their consumer. Their employees take advantage. You ever try to find help in Sears? Hey, excuse me, excuse me, you bring a baby. Excuse me. And as soon as they hear a customer holler, they run into where? The back room. Am I right or wrong? Okay, right or wrong. Or they do one of these. Yeah, uh, uh, see the hot air balloon at the end of that aisle? It's about a quarter mile down, third, third row on the left, you'll see it. Am I right or wrong? But I'm going to tell you what, if that customer was going to feed your kids today, I'd, put them, I'd hold her hand to go to the woman's lingerie section and find her something. Am I right or wrong? Or take the, take the men to wherever. I, 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 you know what I mean, okay? You understand where I'm going with this gang, yes or no? Okay, so we got to understand the true value of the relationship. And then you want to focus on first building a group of 500 before you focus on doing anything else. Forget about marketing to the whole town. Don't buy into this billboard, sides of buses. Always remember to be successful in business. It's not your gross, it's your net that's important. Why 500? Because the marketing gurus tell us if you have a relationship with 500, 20% of them will give you a hot lead a year. Out of those 100 hot leads, you'll have a conversion of one in two, which is 50 listings. If half sell, half buy from you again, you're looking at 37.5 transactions, 40 transactions to round it off at 6,000. It's $240,000. Okay? So for, remember in business, gang, it's your gross, not your net, or that's your net, not your gross that's important. So we focus on building that social capital. After you build those relationships, then you've got to learn to stay in touch forever. Now, I want to give you some statistics that's going to blow your socks off. The first statistic, and this comes from NAR. They did a study that 52% of all homeowners 52% of all people that have used a licensed realtor believe that realtor's their friend at the end of the transaction. That's pretty powerful, wouldn't you agree? Heck, I know prime ministers and presidents would like to have those numbers, right? So 52%. Now, here's what was interesting. The study went on to say only 17% used the same realtor twice. What's that tell us? We're not staying in what? We're not staying in touch. So I want to give you a very, very simple plan to stay in touch. And if you follow this plan, I'll guarantee you it'll pay off for you in the long run. The first one is you want to have four personal touches a year with the people in your social capital list or sphere of influence list. You need to pick up the phone or do a drop by four times a year and have a real conversation. Ask them about their wife, their husband, their kids. How's your parents doing? How are you enjoying the house? What did you think about the community? Whatever the case may be. It doesn't have to be real estate related. But of course, somewhere through that conversation, you're in real estate, they're going to ask you how what? How's business? Okay? Four personal touches a year. Well, Mark, should I do drop bys or should I pick up the phone? Well, here's the deal. Okay? Um, there's no difference. There's no difference. In fact, I personally would prefer you to call me than do a drop-by. Why? Because a drop-by, I feel like you're invading my personal space unannounced. Am I right or wrong? Okay, that's the facts. Now, 
I don't care what anybody says. Whatever you hear from Mark Leader, ask yourself this. How would I feel if that was done to me? And if you can answer, I'm okay with it, it's probably okay. So picture this. It's Thursday night. It's 5 o'clock. I finally get uh, uh, to be at home with my honey and the kids at the same time. Because in our busy lives, one's showing up at 8, 7. We get the barbecue on. Going to have a beer. Kids are up playing their Xbox or whatever, but we're all going to have a family meal. Doorbell rings. Because no one's doing these drop-bys. I mean, why would you drop by at 11 in the morning when everybody's at work? Okay, you're dropping by when you expect people will be home. Am I right or wrong? Okay, you show up and you should do it once. That's nice. Drop by. Nice little fruit basket worth all of 89 cents. Boy, that's nice. Okay, because you're not giving me a $1,000 gift every time you do a drop-by. Am I right or wrong? Okay, and the agent makes their way in. Next thing you know, the barbecue's off. Yeah, come on in. You want a cup of tea? You want to, I, I don't want to encourage alcohol, but would you like a cold beer? And they sit there, and all of a sudden, 15, 20, 30, 45-minute conversation goes by. And when they leave, at the end of the whole deal, the only reason the person was there was they were looking for you to send them what? How would you feel? Am I right or wrong? Do you see where I'm going with this? And I know some of you don't like what you're hearing because some of you have bought into that. And, I, and, and I'll tell you what, if it's working for you, keep doing it. But I was never a short nickel guy. I want a long dime. I want my career to get easier and easier and easier, just like my relationship with Miss Lori here at the BMO. Okay? It started out three years ago with one presentation. Let's see what the guy's got. Then it went to two presentations. Then last year was three presentations, doing study, 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 study. Am I right or wrong? Okay, big corporate America, that's the way it works, and I understand that. Prove yourself, make your bones. Then she shares with you today that 98%, which I think is a pretty high number, okay? But 98% felt they got value out of spending time with me. So that means that I'm telling you what I believe you need to hear. You with me on this, gang, yes or no? And I'm going to tell you what, you show up at my house at 5.30 when I'm about to get an hour with my family, and at the end of the deal, it's all just a fine business for you, I'm going to be one PO'd customer. But if you took five minutes and you gave me a quick shout, even at 7 o'clock at night, hey, hey, Susan, yeah, it's Mark calling, how you doing? Hey, I don't mean to interrupt you, but listen, I just wanted to check on how's things at the house, how'd they do in hockey this year? You know, I've seen one of them at the rink. God, they're growing up big since you got the, right? If there's anything I can do for you, if you know anybody that might, please remember me. I hope you guys are doing well. And if there's anything I can do, either personally or professional, please remember you got a friend in Mark Leader. Let's talk again soon, okay? You're probably okay with that if I gave you great service to begin with. Am I right or wrong? And I do it two, three, four times a year, maybe a Christmas call to wish you Merry Christmas. Did you get the fruit basket? Okay, that's all positive stuff. So you got to think about when you stay in touch forever, you got to think how, how, are, how would I feel and how you feel. See, we all put our pants on one leg at a time. I don't care what your color, creed, your background is. I just recently found out that I'm not really Canadian. No, I did. So did my wife. I thought I married a French Canadian. Okay, we found out about seven years ago, she's not a French Canadian, she's Métis. And what that is, is that's French and Canadian Indian in her background. Okay, so which I have to fight, I mean, you know, okay. So I just found out three years ago, I'm not Canadian either. I got English and Canadian Indian in my background, so I'm actually a Métis too. Do you follow me? But here's what, has anything changed? The answer is what? No, and with this whole genome theory and all this stuff, what do they say, 99.7% of us are identical DNA and all that stuff, and the 0.3 is what makes our eyes, hair, and all that different? Well, 0.3 of a trillion cells, that's still a lot. But really, when it's said and done, it means that we all basically are the what? All the same. So four personal touches a year. You want to send them something through snail mail, gang, 12 times a year. You want to... Do 12 internet-based marketing pieces. But I wouldn't do more than that because you'll get bumped into the spam. And you want to do 365 days of social networking. In other words, build that group of 500 onto your Facebook page. But I wouldn't spend any more than 30 minutes a day. 
I wouldn't spend any more than 30 minutes a day. In fact, I'd prefer you to spend 15 minutes a day on Facebook. It's a way to drip on that group. Now, once you're staying in touch forever, that brings me to my fourth point. And my fourth point is, is okay, well, we've talked about how the importance of relationships. Well, how do I find these relationships? Well, finding the relationships is the big battle in the real estate industry, and it really comes down to two methods in 14 ways. The two methods are we've got high tech today and high touch. So when we talk about high tech, there's seven specific ways to build relationships using high tech or technology. We got our personal website. We can do automated personal email, automated snail mail, automated target marketing pieces, automated internet marketing pieces. We can do our social networking using uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and all that stuff. And of course, I separate that from Facebook because Facebook professional page is the big kahuna out there today. They have over a billion members. Okay, but the problem with all of this is, is, is really threefold. Number one is high tech. High tech is used for maintaining relationships more successfully than it will ever be in building new relationships. High tech will be used for keeping your mind, keeping your name top of mind awareness in the community. And high tech is a cost effective way to do a drip campaign on people. But I'm going to do something here that you're not going to hear from any other speaker in the industry. And again, Mark Leader is going to walk out on the edge of the cliff. And this cliff may, this cliff may ensure that you never hear me again. Or it may ensure that for some of you, you'll go back to your companies and say, why haven't we brought this guy in? Because he speaks from the heart, but shoots from the what? Hip. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. 15 years ago, 19 years ago, I guess now, I made a list of 20 companies. And on that list, I thought if I could get hired by these 20 companies, I truly had made a name for myself in the training and speaking business. They were the who's who, if you want to talk about that. And up until eight months ago, I had 18 of those names crossed off that I'd done work with. Of course, there's the traditional ones, the large franchises, the C21s, the Coldwell Banker, the Remaxes. They're all part of that. But there was two gentlemen that still run. Um, well, one now is not only an independent, but has a franchise network included. And one is a, still a very large independent. And these two gentlemen had never hired me. Those two companies, one is Long & Foster out of Washington, um, has about 10,000 agents at the height of the market, had about 19,000 agents, but it got about 10 right now, and is still rated in the top, take the franchises out, number three or four below the franchises as being one of the most successful real estate organizations. And as I grew up in the industry, I heard about West Foster, West Foster, West Foster. In January of this, no, no, uh, no it's all part of going the 50, I forget. Uh, November of this year, I get a call from Long and Foster. And they said, Mark, we hear that you put together a new management program and that you're teaching managers how to literally, the average manager that takes your program hires three salespeople within a 30-day period. And then you teach them how to make those salespeople productive. I said, yes, I do. He said, I'd like to hire you and bring you in to train all of my 200 managers on that system. I said, really, Mr. Foster? I said, I, I, said, I got to ask you, sir, after all these years, I've been down to see two of your past presidents, two of your past training directors. Why now? Because they all said no to me. He said, well, he said, the problem is, he said, I, I told him you need to meet this guy. I didn't say you need to hire this guy. And sometimes a company can get so big, they're better off not doing something than to do something. Does that make sense? 
I said, that's fair enough. But he said, don't worry, Mark. He said, he said I'm back. I said, that's cool. And I went down, I trained, and of course I got more stuff booked for them because he's a proactive builder. You follow me? I don't think it's three days later I get a call from the Weikert organization out in New Jersey. They don't even want to, they won't not, not only want to hire me, they want me to do the keynote at their convention. And I said to the fellow who hired me, I said, Bill, don't do this to me, sir. He says, what do you, he says, I thought you'd be pleased. He said, you're getting the keynote at the convention. All the major franchise, all the major officers will be there. I says, man, that's like baptismal by fire at your company. Don't do that to me. He says, well, Mark, he says, Mr. Weikert says, we want you. And what Mr. Weikert wants, we get. I said, okay, fair enough. Now, can I tell you how many times I called Mr. Weikert over 19 years? I called him every 90 days for 19 years till he hired me. Give or take. Sometimes it was four months. Every 90 days for 19 years. So optimism and perseverance is a big part of being successful in the sales business. Am I right or wrong? Okay? Understand that. You give me an optimistic work ethic person, I'll teach them how to make a six-figure income in the business. But you got to give me work ethic, and you got to give me every day is the best day of your life. Because it is. You live in the greatest nation in the world. I'll tell you the Weikert story in a minute, but i got to put this in. United States of America is the greatest nation in the world, bar none. This is the nation where millions of people every day are risking their lives. They're sending their most valuable, their children, across rivers to live the American dream. Am I right or wrong? Whether you agree with what's going on down south or not, that's a, I, I ain't talking, I ain't getting into the politics, I'm getting into the big scheme of things, that women that bring children into this world, their most precious commodity they have, are risking the lives. Am I right or wrong? The American people will raise a child to the age of 18, 19 years old to have them go fight a war on the other side of the world, okay, so that those people can live the dream too. Who's the first nation to step up when a country's truly in trouble? The United States of America, okay? You live in the greatest nation bar none, and I personally believe if you bump into a mother or father that is a child in the military, you should hug them. And you should buy them lunch, dinner, coffee, wherever they're in line behind you, you should look after it. Why? Because without them, we wouldn't have our opportunities. If you buy into that, put your hands together. So I'm at this Weikert conference down at Caesars Palace, Atlantic City. Okay? If that is not intimidating enough. You know, the same stage that, like, the, the bigs are on, you know? And uh, so anyhow, I don't know where it came to me, but it hit me. And I went with it. Because sometimes you got to use your what? Your gut, your intuition. And, and so I stood on the edge of the stage and I said to all the Gen X's and Gen Y's and the millennials out there, I'm going to share something with you. And you call me old school if you want. But I'm going to tell you what, gang, and make no mistake about it, and I'm fighting a battle like I haven't fought in years. Okay? I fought a battle many a times in this business to making sure you guys have what you need to be successful for all the shooting stars that come in. The new, I'm the number one, do what I do. But I'm fighting a battle right now that probably be the greatest battle I'm going to face with a microphone in my hand, and that is I'm fighting all of the tech companies out there. Everywhere you read, Inman News, Riz Media, the newspaper, they're telling you this widget, this gadget, this iPhone, this is the future of, am I right or wrong? Make no mistake about it. Facebook does not sign listing agreements. Social networking does not sign listing agreements. We are in a relationship-based business and stop texting people and pick up the phone and have a conver what? Station. Right. We are in the business of communication and conversating. And I'm going to tell you what. The quicker you come to terms with that, the more money you will make in less what? 
time and the fun will come in because you will reap the rewards of the referrals because you have built relationships. So I do this conference, the place is packed, all this stuff afterwards, I am totally emotionally and physically drained. I get up to my room, I get packed, I change my shirt because you wouldn't want to be sitting beside me on the plane. I'm getting out of the hotel and this tall, good-looking, older man comes up to me. And he says, hey, Mr. Leader. And I turned and I look, and it could only be a voice of authority. You follow me? And he walks over like this to me, sticks out his hand. So he goes, no, your other hand. Is it your other hand? No? Sore? Is it sore, your other hand? He says, Mr. Leader? I said, yes. Jim Weikert, pleasure to meet you. The man himself, right? Started off with one office back in 68. Got 14,000 salespeople. Making some what? Yeah, he didn't want to sleep in the hotel, so he had his helicopter drive him from his house and put him on the top of Caesars to go down to shake hands for the day. Making a little bit of what? Right. A little bit of money. And he says, I want to congratulate you, son. I said, well, thank you, Mr. Weicker. Do we actually have our bloodlines? <laughs> he laughs. Yeah, you never know. Maybe I go on easy street, right? You know? And uh, he said, no. He said, um, I give you credit. He said, I don't know if it was 14, 15, or 20 years, but he said, I do know you called me a lot. And he said, and he said you're the only speaker that we've had that actually stood on the front of the stage and told the salespeople what they needed to hear. That Facebook doesn't sign listing agreements. That all the money I've made in this business, and gang, by the way, I would be able, I'd be willing to bet this money in my pocket right now that less than 10% of you show up at the office every day at the time Mr. Weicker does at the age of 78. Guess what time he's in the office every day? 5.30. Every day. Every day. You follow me? Okay? So he's a worker, even at his age, and he's not doing it for the what? He's doing it now because he loves it. And he said, you're the only one that actually stood up and said to the salespeople what they needed to hear. And what they needed to hear was we are in the relationship-based business, and the only way you do that is by just one more time, humor me, having a conver what? Sation. So if you want to make more money, you want to do it in less time, you got to master these seven things with prospecting. The first one is, when we talk about high touch, this is proactive. In other words, when you leave here today, you will be able to generate whatever income that you want to generate. Lori, could you check the timer? I've got 34 minutes on the screen up front and 20 minutes left on my watch. Should I go with the timer? I'd love to go with the timer. Okay. So the first is understand social capital. Okay? We are in a relationship-based business. You need to cultivate those relationships. You need to nurture those relationships, and you need to understand that when it's said and done, according to the National Association of Realtors, the average family will move seven times. You take your $6,000 and end, that means every relationship you have in your community is potentially worth $42,000 to you in your business life cycle. Okay? It's the day, the day of the one-off isn't there. Now, so where do we build this? Well, you've got a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. You've all heard that old poem. I can guarantee you if we went through this audience, all of you probably are creatures of habit just like me. I go to the same grocery store. I go to the same health club. I almost try. If I don't get to park at my same parking spot at the health club and get my same locker, it can throw me off. You ever feel like that? Yes or no? Okay. Well, that's my locker. What are you doing there? Okay. Get out of my space here, man. That's my bench. Hey, am I right or wrong? Okay. I don't know why. It just is. We're creatures of habit. Well, ask yourself something. You've probably gone to the same dry cleaners for years. If you're in the real estate business, you're wearing dry clean clothes, okay? 
What's the name of the dry cleaner behind the counter that serves you? Oh, I know you go to Dion's dry cleaning or Sam and Joe's dry cleaning or Barbara Schwartz dry cleaning. I'm talking about the woman or man right behind the counter that hands you that stuff with the sweat pouring down their face because it's 130 degrees in there. The one that says, have a nice day. Thanks for coming. What about the butcher that every Friday has cut your meat so you can have your barbecue on Saturday? What's his name or her name? Are they married? Do they have two and a half kids? How old are the kids? What about if you guys are like so many other places, if you got children and you go to pick your kids up at school, we're not allowed on the property grounds anymore back in Canada, Ontario anyways. Well, my kids are almost out now. But we used to have to stand by the road because we non- that didn't go to school, we're allowed to, remember you used to go stand in the playground or wait by the front door? They, they stopped all that. We got to stand out in the parking lot to pick up our kids. That means that you're sitting there with 40, 50, 60 other parents that are probably on the same type of routine. Am I right or wrong? Do you know who they are? What their names are? Or do you go to that same one person every time? Do you follow me where I'm going with this gang? Yes or no? See, the neat thing about real estate is when you're out in the community, there's, it's acres of diamonds. Acres of diamonds. You ever heard the story about acres of diamonds? Just one head's going up and down. I'll tell you a story very quickly. It's, a, it's an old uh, Napoleon Hill story. But it's a true story, apparently, and it comes from Africa. There was a man who, second generation, inherited this father's farm. It was a huge, massive farm, very successful farm. But it wasn't, he didn't believe it was his future. Okay? Everybody was making uh, tens of thousands of dollars today's money, millions of dollars in the uh, mining business, mining for diamonds. So he sells his farm, the family farm, and takes the money. And over the next 30 years of his life, travels throughout Africa, mining for diamonds, only to become an old man and broke. He takes his last few dollars that he has, hitches rides to get back home to the old homestead area where he grew up. He thought he'd get a little shanty in town. At least die, be buried in the same place that his father was. He comes back only to find that the family farm has become into the world's largest diamond find ever in the history of man. Ever. And of course, the moral of the story is this. Quite often, we're looking outside for our riches. Am I right or wrong? When it's right here in front of us. I get people ask me all the time, Mark, what do you define definition of success? I say, well, definition of being a rich man. And, he, and they say, yes. I say, well, my definition of being a rich man is dying with one wife, having my wife love me and me cater her to her life and raise her up. And to have my children look up to me as someone that was a good role model. I have a good relationship with them. If I can accomplish those two things in life, my material belongings mean absolutely nothing to me. Do you follow me? But the odd thing about it, when I focus on what's in front of me, all of the other stuff seems to come together around me. Because there's an old saying, a happy wife makes a happy life. But let me take it one step further. When you have a good personal life, you then can have a clear head to focus on what? Business. Does that make sense to you, yes or no? Okay, so we got to build our social capital, gang, and we need to touch out and build those relationships. You need to wear your name badges. Forget about this casual Friday stuff. Look successful, look rich, even if you aren't. Tommy Hopkins taught us that fake it until you make it. Okay, if you look successful, they'll want to do business with you because obviously you are good at what you do. The second one then is you got to work expired listings every day. Expired listings every day. Now the big challenge with working expired is twofold. Number one, the time and effort it takes to research them. And if you would like a system to do that, we have a system in place, and I'm happy to give you a 30-day trial on that. You write on the back of your business coaching, coaching and expireds. I'll get my office to call you, and you can have a 30-day trial at that without me getting into great detail with you. They'll explain it to you.
But when it's said and done, understand this about expireds, that 8 out of 10 will list again. And the whole key to working expireds is this, is let them vent. Let them vent. Because you had someone go to their house, make them a bunch of promises, and never delivered. That more often than not, 80% of the industry lists the house, and then they do the hope and pray method. I hope and pray it sells. I hope and pray it sells. And the people never hear from them again. Or they hear from them every second day that the, uh, when you cut through the conversation, they really did nothing. Do you follow me? In other words, they didn't build the muscle to get the job done. Along with that, you've got to learn to reignite their desires. So you've got to find out where they were going and what the reason for that is and get them excited about that. And, and the last thing with working expireds, if they ask you why it didn't sell, don't ever blame the price. Blame the other agent. <laughs> now, I know some of you laugh, and some of the old timers, I caught you off guard with that. I'll never teach you anything illegal, unethical, or immoral. Okay? So let me show you how to do this. Because they can't blame themselves. They can't blame the house. They've only got one person to blame. Am I right or wrong? They've got to justify why there's no sold sign up. So I would do something like this, say, Mr. Miss, I got a copy of your listing in front of you. Want to tell me a little bit about the house? And they say, Oh, well, we built a, an extra large garage and my husband put extra heavy duty insulation in the attic. Oh, let me write that down. That's not on the listing. And we built a big deck on the back and we used long, extra heavy duty nails. Oh, okay, let me make a note of that. That wasn't on the listing. So all of a sudden, we're pointing out stuff that's not on the listing. What's automatically the, their homeowners thinking? That darn realtor didn't listen to what I had to say. Is there anything unethical or immoral about that? Yes or no? No, there's not. Okay, all we're doing is pointing out things that were important to them. See, I'll guarantee you what's important to them. You're not writing on the listing. You're marketing it thinking what's important to get the phone ring. Am I right or wrong? Working expires. The third area, third one is you got to work FISBOs every day. Now, here's the keys with FISBOs. You need to demonstrate to them how you will put more money in their pocket even after paying a commission. And when you can do that, they will sign with you like that. The number one mistake most realtors make when they work FISBOs is they go in and tell them about their great marketing plan and the great this and the great that. But gang, don't misunderstand me when I tell you this. They don't believe you. They don't believe you, they don't trust you, and they don't think you got any value. Oh, I'm not talking as a human being. I'm just talking in general because they have heard this dog and pony already. Are you with me on this? Yes or no? Okay. At some time in their life, they've had a bad experience with a realtor. That, that makes me believe that they think they can do it themselves. So you need to show them how you can do it for them and you can do it and put more money in their pocket. And when you do that, all of a sudden, they're going to line up and they want to list with you. The fourth high touch you need to master is open houses. Now, I know some of my competitors in the training industry will say, ah, leaders talking open houses again, eh? Psh, that crap don't work. Well, here, let me tell you something, okay? The cheese has moved. The cheese has moved. If you are not doing 20 transactions a year closed, you should be doing two to four open houses a month. An hour and a half, two hours at the most. Some will argue it should be longer than that. I don't think so. Okay? Now, why? Well, first of all, let's look at the research. Gen X, Gen Y, the millennials, okay? They're not baby boomers. Baby boomers, when dad said, use this realtor, listen to him, he'll give you good advice, we use dad's realtor. Am I right or wrong? When dad, we, dad told us to use this lawyer, we used dad's lawyer. Am I right or wrong? And whatever that lawyer said, if dad said you could trust him, we trusted him and we did it. Am I right or wrong, baby boomers? Well, today we're dealing with the highest educated population ever in the history of mankind. More kids coming out of college today and university and moving back home than they ever were. Something about us guys that generation, the old man said, go out and get work, and you did, and you just never came home again. Am I right or wrong? In fact, some of them actually dropped out of school and created things called Apple and Microsoft. Who would imagine that free-thinking, hard-working people could actually create something wonderful? Just something for us to consider if, you've got, if you're a parent moving to that stage. What's more important? Having you with me? 
What's more important, creating free thought, work ethic, honesty, integrity? But anyhow, another topic for another day. So, 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 but what these folks are doing, you see, 92% of them are doing research online before they ever talk to a realtor. That means a big chunk of them are going to go want to touch feel before they talk to a realtor. So I'm not saying they're not going to talk to dad's realtor, but this is the generation that shows up at the doctor's office and said, doc, I don't need to disrobe and have you give me a physical. I need this medication, and here's why. Am I right or wrong? Okay, that's the way it is, gang. So how are you going to meet them? Well, one of the ways you're going to meet them is by holding open houses. Now, here's the deal with open houses. Even if you don't get anybody to your open house, it doesn't matter. Let me sell you on the idea. First of all, it gives you something to put up on Facebook saying, I am a full-time active professional in this community. Number two, it gives you a reason to send mailers out to the houses around the open house inviting them out. Number three, it gives you an honest reason to pick up the phone or go knock on the door of where those mailers went and say, hi, my, na my name is, and I'd like to invite you to, would you know anybody who might? In other words, it's giving you a reason to have a conver what? Station. You can call all your buyers on file that you haven't closed and said, why don't you come on out and visit me? You see, gang, it's about creating a conversation. The fifth area then, or the fifth one is the community involvement. Each and every one of you should be part of PTA, Rotary, Lions Club, the local hockey, the local baseball, the local ballet, whatever it may be. But in the position of those community involvement, you need to be the worker bee. Don't strive to be the president of the Rotary Club. Why? Because if you're the president, 49% will hate you, 49% will love you. Am I right or wrong? But if you're the busy worker bee that's willing to help out, I ain't talking 100 hours a week, but front and center out in the public. If you're doing the, uh, the beer and burger thing to raise money for the local uh, uh, whatever, you're the guy flipping burgers or you're the gal serving beer saying, hey, Sally, how are you? How's Bob? You coming to get a beer? You, you follow me? With some name recognition, the name of your company on the back or whatever the case may be. You need to be front and center out in your community because people that support the community, the community will support them back. The sixth area is if none of these work, then put on a nice outfit, get a partner, and go out and do some door knocking. Go out and do some door knocking and say, hi, my name is, I'd like to introduce me, induce you. Would you be interested? Would you know anybody who might? And if door knocking's not your thing, then you can do what I did to bring in four, probably 500 out of those 1,000 listings, gang. And that is that you can do that old cold calling. Now, some of you are going to go, oh, I wouldn't cold call. I wouldn't cold call. Well, look at me for a second. Okay, at 21 years old, if you knew me, you weren't doing business with me. You heard with me? If you had known me for the last five or ten years when I was in my early 20s, go, holy cow, I ain't dealing business with that guy. Nice guy, but I, you get the idea, okay? So I'm 21, 22 years old. I finally get taught how to truly sell real estate, and I start hitting the phones. Well, I'll guarantee you, out of the thousand listings, I brought in 400 to 500 of them was pure cold calls. Now, let me show you the math on this, because, because you can come up with anything you want. But you need to see, I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy. Um, never will profess I'm the brightest light bulb in the box, the sharpest tack. Okay? I've always actually believed that I'm glad I'm not, because I had to use work ethic and a little bit of brute force. Do you follow me? In order to be successful. In other words, get up, suit up, and show up, and put in a good 8 or 10 hours a day. That's a big part of my success. But let's assume, for example, that you learn the dialogue technique and process necessary. You learn the track, okay? And let's assume, and I'll guarantee you, when you get better, okay, these numbers will going to be much better than this. But let's assume that you do nothing but for 10 hours a week call strange people, okay? <laughs> Strangers. You scrub the list. I don't need to go through all that. You scrub the list and all that. So for 10 hours, you make the calls. And in those 10 hours, you book three appointments, which generally will take you about an hour an appointment. We're at 13. 
to bring in the listing that sells, okay, you do some marketing, promotion, negotiating. 10, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 hours you got invested in. Now, 18 hours divided by the 6,000 you told me, let's make that 20 hours. Okay, into the 6K, that works out to $300 an hour. $300 an hour. Think about this for a minute. Now, you need to understand something. When I got taught this, I was 21, 22, 23 years old. And I thought, man, I have died and gone to heaven. Okay, all my buddies who gone to work off in the factory or they're gone to do their seven-year schooling to be doctors and lawyers, okay, I don't have to be in the work at seven. The office opens at nine. Sounds good to me. Am I right or wrong? That means I can usually pull off the 930 and get away with it. Okay? I get to wear nice clothes. Right? Okay? I get to work. The industry was filled, what, 70, 80% were women in those days. I was single. Don't get me wrong. Okay? I get to work with an office full of professional women all dressed up to the nines. Ooh, I like this. You follow me? It's air conditioned. It's heated. Okay? Well, my, some of my friends went and did what? Construction, roofing, building houses. Am I right or wrong? Okay? They worked in the factory so they could get a steady check because that's what the dad did. Okay? And I'm thinking, man, I've died and gone to heaven. Okay? Free coffee, good looking women around me. Okay? Air conditioning, right? And all I got to do is pick up the phone and have people say no to me. Boy, and all of a sudden it started to click and I started booking appointments. And all of a sudden, I book my three, and I go out, and I get my one. And then I book my three, and I get two. Next thing you know, I'm booking three, and I'm getting three, because I'm going in with the attitude, if I want to take it, I'm going to what? Take it. All of a sudden, I go from $9,000 to the following year. When I learned this stuff, I made $100,000. Went into the 100000 Club, or whatever it was called. The following year, I went into, they called Centurion in those days. I worked for Century 21. Next thing I know, I'm a five-time centurion. I am the youngest person ever to be inducted into the Century 21 Worldwide Hall of Fame at the age of 27. I lived an hour and a half north of Toronto, 12,000 population. My best year was I closed 153 transactions with an average commission of $3,500. Figure the math out and take it back 25 years. You with me? All of a sudden, I thought, holy cow. I hope no one else figures this out, right? $300 an hour. And you know what minimum wage was in those days? Do you have any idea what minimum wage was? You probably won't even remember. $2.05 if you're a student and two fifteen dollars if you're an adult. Think about that. Think about that. And all you have to do is you just got to have a little bit of work ethic. You got to have a little bit of perseverance. And here's the worst thing. Someone that you will never see again in your life said no to you. Well, I'm 23 and I'm at the bar every weekend. I'm getting that every weekend. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Or else you get the nice girls, they give you the fake phone number. Thought, oh, today was, tonight was good. I got three phone numbers, so I called them the next day. <laughs> you follow me on this, gang? Yes or no? But yet, we hate it. We hate it. We would rather in the real estate industry live a life of poverty than to sit down at a desk and have a stranger say no to us. Heck, forget about a stranger. I've been married 28 years. You know how many times I've heard no in 28 years? <laughs> She's mastered that. I love you, babe. They're recording it, by the way. You follow where I'm going with this, gang? Yes or no? And the worst thing you got to do, turn to the person beside you, holler no right now. Do it for me. Do it! Come on! What do they call the, the folks with the football here in this neck of the woods? What do they call them? Packers, yeah. Cheeseheads, Packers, right? Okay, give me a real, if you're at a Packers game and you're going to give a shout at that game, use that volume and holler at the person no beside you. Do it now. No! See, and no one has died in here. Am I right or wrong? 
So, so my question then lies to this, is that you can buy billboards, sides of buses. And by the way, I teach all 14 ways. Do you know why I teach all 14 ways? I can tell you why, honestly, I teach all 14 ways. Why? Because a lot of people will not do the one that makes them the most money in the least amount of time. They would rather bitch and complain and moan and groan in the office and make all kinds of excuses. Oh, it's Obama. It's Bush. It's the Fed. It's, it's Israel. It's Syria. It's this. It's the fire season. Oh, it was really snowy this year. Well, guess what? That is a salesman's dream, the winter we just had. Well, what are you talking about, Mark? Well, if they didn't own a snow machine, they were probably at home. <laughs> Which means that I had more people answer the what? Oh. Oh. My whole office, oh, it's a snow day, I'm not coming in. You know when I booked more appointments than anyone? When every factory and every school was closed in town. Oh, it's the long weekend, I ain't working. You know when I got more people at my open houses? When everyone else was off. You see, you want to make a certain amount of money, gang? You want to make two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year? You got to do what others don't do. And you see, the truth is, being self-employed, you're going to have to do some things that others will never do. I'll give you a very quick example. Once a year when I was older, my father would allow... Uh, after all the staff was gone from my mother's pizza parlor, on Christmas Eve, my dad and I still worked. We let the staff go at 6, six 7 o'clock, depending on how busy we were, and we stayed open till 9. And then between 9 and 10, we cleaned up and we went home for our Christmas. The only day of the year we were closed was on Christmas morning. Um, might have been maybe... New, not New Year's morning either, because they're all hung over. Everyone wants the fruit, wants the pizza. Yeah. So, so, so anyhow, my dad would get us a little bottle of whiskey. I was about 15 years old at the time. Drinking age in Canada was 18. Quebec, it was 16 in those days. So understand the Canadian culture. Okay, we just drink a lot. <laughs> um, not so much now, but th those days we did. Mad has corrected a lot of that. Um, but anyhow, so him and I would have a Ryan Coke. We'd still have mums coming in, okay, the last minute, grabbing things. The mall's closing, didn't have time to get dinner. You know, you know what I'm saying? And I said to my dad one time, I said, Dad, I don't get it. He said, what's that? I said, it's Christmas Eve. Everyone else is at family. There's music playing in their houses. You and I are mopping floors. He says, well, son, he said, you got to remember something. In order to get, you got to be prepared to give. And he said, when the majority of people in this community can't go spend two weeks at Disneyland in March, we'll be in Disneyland spending 24 hours a day together. When the majority of people can't afford to have a nice boat at the dock, we're going to be out boating all summer. When the majority of people can't afford to remodel their house when it needs to be done, we can do that. And when the majority of people live week by week and we've got four or five months worth of bills, the money put in the bank in advance in the event there's illness or sickness. But in order to get that, you got to be prepared to what? Give a little. Do you follow me on this, gang? Yes or no? And this brings me back to... You don't have to spend a bunch of money to make money in the real estate business, but you got to be prepared to do the things that others aren't prepared to do. And when you do that, you will then reap rewards that others don't reap. The sixth thing then, when you do master and you understand the true power of high-touch prospecting, you got to practice, drill, and rehearse it. you got to practice, drill, and rehearse it. You have to master the dialogue, technique, and process. Understand something. There is no winging a professional realtor's presentation. There is no winging a conversation that a professional salesperson has. They understand from the time that phone is answered, they listen to voice inflection, tone of the call, 
They bring them through the identify, introduce, ask. They give their reason, ask again. Move to an approach, which is your five stock questions. Then you move to the cost associated with waiting because fear of loss is a greater motivator than opportunity to gain. After they demonstrate the potential loss, they then show them how they can save them that money and offer them a fair trade and close three times for the appointment. It is a proven process no different than mom making her spaghetti sauce or making an apple pie. It is a process that you follow. And the more you follow that process, the better you what? Get. And the better you get, the higher your hit ratio happens. You know, I was doing training in my office just before I sold it. And I was teaching some of the salespeople um, this. And one guy says, that stuff don't work. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I'll put $100 out right now, and I'll give you five to one odds on that 100 that I can make within 10 phone calls. I can book three appointments, and I'll go out and get it tonight. And if I do that, you give me 100 If I don't, I'll give you a $500 bonus on your next deal. Seems pretty fair, doesn't it? He said, okay, but who's going to pick the numbers? I tossed him the phone book. Rip a page out. Just make sure it's from our town. He ripped the page out. I said, now, give me an area of that page. Within the sixth call, I'd booked my first appointment. By the tenth call, I'd booked three. And that night I went out and I listed a little home out in Tiny Township the man had, which was his mother's that he'd been renting for about five years for $89,000. And it sold 30 days later. And, I, and, and when I come home, come in the office the next day, and I brought the agents back together again, I said, see, what did I tell you? The stuff what? Works. But the only way it works is that if you have to what first? Work. You have to get up, suit up, and show up. And the rest is teachable. The rest is teachable. And part of the teaching is understanding that in order to master it, you must drill you must uh, master the dialogue, technique, and process. Everything has a dialogue, technique, and process. No different than building that garden. No different than building the house. Now, men, you wouldn't understand this, but actually Christmas Eve, all those toys we built actually had instructions to them. <laughs> and if we followed the instructions, we wouldn't have the thought that, why did they send us 27 extra screws? You follow me? If you follow the process, you get to the end result quicker with a higher return for your time and money invested. And when you, the seventh point I want to share with you, oh, dialogue, technique, and process. I'm sorry I didn't give that to you sooner. And the seventh point I want to share with you, gang, is we got to learn to protect our commissions. In every presentation I do, I write in the contract that I get to spend at least five to 10 minutes on talking to the salespeople about commissions and how important they are. You see, gang, anyone can give away your service. Giving away your service, that doesn't take skill. In order to be successful in the real estate business, picture this, every 1% cut in your commission, if you go from a seven to a six, that's a 17% pay cut. And next time you cut your commissions, when you go home at night and you say to your honey, hey, babe, guess what? We made four grand today. I sold that house. But you don't tell them that you cut $1,500 off your commission to put the deal together. So why don't you come home and say this? Hey, babe, guess what? I gave away $1,500 of our money tonight. Aren't you proud of me? Because the truth is, that's what you're doing. That's what you are doing. Now, in order to protect those commissions, there's a couple of things that I got to share with you. Number one is, is you got to be prepared to prospect until you get a good one. Okay? Whatever form of prospecting that is, when I talked about the high touch, I did all seven of those, but I can tell you that I cold called every week. Even in my eighth and ninth year where I was doing 80, 90 deals a year, I still cold called on a regular basis. My mother-in-law, who... Um, is one of the greatest realtors I ever met. Um, she's slowing down right now. Um, she's only going to do about 55 or 60 deals this year with one personal assistant at the age of 74, taking a month and a half off up at her cottage on the island in Georgian Bay, and of course always taking three quarters of December and January off for her baking for her grandkids and all of that stuff. 
okay? And I will tell you, okay, that she's one of the best realtors I ever seen. I know because I worked with her. When she was my competition, we fiercely battled. Then she came and worked with me at my brokerage. And I seen and learned so much from her, okay? She's in the office every day, no later than 8 o'clock in the morning, okay? And she's on that phone. If she's not out on a listing appointment or presenting an offer, she's on that phone from 9.15 to 5 o'clock every day and quite often at night, calling and talking, calling and talking. In other words, having a what? Conversation with people. She knows everybody in the community, goes through the grocery store. Hey, Rosie, how you doing? How's the grandkids? It started off with the kids. Now it's grandkids. Okay. Checks the obituaries every day in the newspaper to see if she's got any appointments outside of the office because you got to go pay your respect. Okay. Plus, it's, they're probably got a house to sell. <laughs> you know, wonderful lady with a big heart. May sound terrible, gang, but that's the cycle of life. And I'm going to tell you what, though. If I ever needed a heart transplant, I'd want my mother-in-law's. Yeah, because I think it's never been used. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm just kidding. You. <laughs> ah, you know, just kidding. Yeah, I mean, I got nothing to make fun of anymore, right? I mean, it's like the definition of confusion, watching your mother-in-law drive off a cliff in your new BMW. <laughs> I am so confused here. <laughs> you hear the genie, the old joke about the genie realtor? Realtor's walking through the field, picks up a lamp, gives it a rub. Genie pops out and says, I'm a little bit different than any other genie. I'm going to grant you three wishes, but your mother-in-law gets double. So make him good. He says, no problem. My first wish, I want a big house by the lake. Poof, he's at the lake. He's got the big house. The mother-in-law's across the lake. She's got two of them. Genie says, what's your next wish? He says, well, a house this big, I need some real money, so I want a million dollars untraceable cash. Poof, there's a barrel in front of him, a million dollars in cash. The mother-in-law, she's jumping up and down now. Okay, She's got two million. Jeannie looks at him and says, okay, make this one good. He says, I know exactly what I want. He says, what's that, sir? He says, just scare me half to death. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay to make jokes about mother-in-laws. Am I right? In today's world. <laughs> Anyhow, I will tell you, though, she's one of the greatest, nicest people. I couldn't ask for a better mother-in-law, and I mean that sincerely. But, but she prospects, you have to prospect every day, gang. This business is about having a conversation. Number two is you must book three listing appointments a week. Why three? Because you've got to play the law of averages in sales. You've got to play the law of averages in sales. See, here's the key. If you want to get the best commission every time, you want to make sure you bring in your one listing a week, you've got to understand something. Here's how it works. One won't like you. One can't afford you. One will be ready, willing, and able to do business with you today. That's the way it works. And then finally, number four, you need to master some specific commission techniques. So I'm going to give you, um, let me see here, how many I got? Let's see, what's the first one? The first technique, and I'm going to rapid fire through these, is you got to learn to say no. Okay? If they're not propelling to list at the right price, the right terms, and the right commission, you need to get to the point where you've earned the right to say no. And the only way you've earned the right to say no is by delivering a dynamic presentation. When you deliver a dynamic presentation, then what's going to happen is when you say no, they're going to want you more. That's human nature. Give someone something and take it away, they want that even more. Number two is you could use the morals technique. You could ask them, Mr. and Mrs., where do you work? Well, I work for AT&T. Well, what do they pay you an hour? Pay $20 an hour. Okay, so if you work 40 hours, that would be $800. How would you feel if they only want to pay you $600? Well, I wouldn't be happy. In fact, I'll go in and pound on the desk. We may strike at AT&T for that, for that uh, $200. Well, let me ask you this question. If you don't like doing a, a full job and only getting a part pay, why would you ask me? to do a full job and only take a part pay. It's the morals technique. Number three, then, is the old real estate game. And the old real estate game goes like this. You'd ask the Mr. and Mrs., were you aware that the average realtor only sells seven houses a year? On that seven houses, okay, using an average commission of $6,000, the average realtor will make 42000 Well, that sounds pretty good, but you got to understand, about one-third of this will go to their brokers. 
which is about, oh, 15, 18, 18,000, let's say, which leaves them with uh, 42, 32, about 26,000. Out of that 26,000, you got your MLS dues, you got your special car insurance, marketing, and all of that. You can build your expenses. Let me ask you something. Do you think there's an awful lot of hungry realtors out there? Well, if you were one of those hungry realtors and, there was, and one of your seven buyers were coming in for the day, right, and they're definitely going to buy a house, you got these houses you can show them. Some are paying five, some are paying six, some are paying seven. Would you try to sell them the 5% listings first, yes or no? No, you wouldn't. How about the 6% listings? Probably not. Now, remember, if I cut the commission to six, that would have been your house and you wouldn't even show it, Okay. You'd show them the 7% listings first. Can I ask you why? Why? Well, because I get paid more money. Well, if you're not even in the business and you figured that out, what do you think the other 1,000 realtors are going to say? The fourth one might be the old wimp agent dialogue. Well, Bob down the street said he would do it for six. Say, so, well, let me ask you something. How quick was Bob to go from seven to six? Well, like that. Well, if Bob's that quick to give $2,000 of his money away, how quick is he going to be to give away yours? And then this, the fifth one is the old $6 bill close. And the $6 bill close goes like this. You count out six bills for them. One, two, three, four, five, uh, six. And you say, Mr. and Mrs., you need to understand how commissions work. You see, the odds are there's one of me and 1,500 of them, whatever the number is. That means uh, one, two, three percent will go to the selling broker. That leaves me with 3%. Out of this, one's going to my office, okay? Half is going towards marketing and promoting your house. Half is going towards Washington and taxes. And 1% is left for me to feed, house, and clothe my family. And you want me to give that to you? I think not. See, I'd rather leave here tonight knowing that I didn't make any money than to work for six months, make that investment, and know that I'm not going to make any money. You see, gang, when it's said and done, when you, when you start off with putting the right foundation in place, you put together your goals, you have an awareness of your activities, and you master proven dialogue, skills, and techniques, you can achieve any success and any income level that you choose. Ultimately, life is a series of choices. Every day you're going to choose what type of life you're going to have, what type of lifestyle you are going to enjoy. If you enjoy to live a life of scarcity and do very little work, that's probably what you will achieve. And you will then take on all of the challenges of living that type of life. You see, I've been rich and I've been poor. And I'm going to tell you what, they both have problems, but when you have money, you can generally have enough time to work the problems out. Do you follow me? It's better to be miserable and rich than miserable and poor. It's just the way it works. You want to live a life of abundancy? Then the higher power, whatever it may be, has sent the message to you that all of it is teachable. All of it's there for you. And all of it can be duplicated and you can master it. And when you master the skills, the dialogue and technique, you will truly rise to the top of one of the greatest professions in the world, and that is the profession of making home ownership a dream come true for people within your community, and at the same time, having an absolutely wonderful, wonderful lifestyle for you and your family. I've got two closing points to make very quickly. Come on down. One is I want to thank BMO Harris for having me. It is an honor to work for an organization that exactly about 30 years ago lent me the money to buy my first house. And so that's special to me. Um, and then it's an honor that you gave to me something today, each and every one of you, for being here, greater than any type of money that you could ever part with, and that's your time. It's the greatest gift you can give to somebody. To give to your loved ones, time to give to your husband and wife time. Hug those babies, be proud of what we do, and let me finish off with this poem, and it's called Life. I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay me no more. As I sat in the evening, and I counted my scanty store, 
For life, you see, is just an employer. He'll pay you just what you ask. But once you set the wages, why, you must bear the task. I worked for a menial hire only to learn dismay that any wage, any wage I would have asked out of life, life would have willingly paid. God bless each and every one of you, and I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Was that a great presentation or what? Let's give Mark another hand. You know, training seminars and, and uh, meetings like this where you can learn some things ha are great for you because they give you tools and techniques that you can use to help you sell more homes. But it will only create impact for you if you go out and you implement what you've learned today. And that's always the challenge, is implementing what you learned today. And so when you go back to your offices, when you talk to your friends about what you did today, when they ask you about what you learned, tell them about what you, what you learned here at BMO Harris. Talk, tell them about what you learned from Mark Leader. Um, but then also, at that same time, tell them what you're going to implement. And if you, and if you create that commitment for yourself, they'll help hold you accountable and you'll be able to hopefully sell more homes. So with that, I'm going to uh, introduce myself. I forgot to do that. I'm Dave Sheedy. <laughs> I'm one of the market managers here in, in Milwaukee, and I'm going to hand it over quickly to Amy. Thank you. Um, so thank you again for everyone for taking your time out and coming today. Um, the, the partnership that exists here in this room between you, the realtors, and the mortgage bankers, we think is, is very, very powerful. And I want to just take a page out of Mark's uh, presentation today. Do you notice he numbered things a lot? One, two, three. So um, that partnership, I think there's three keys to that. The first one is that at the beginning and at the end, Mark talked about listings and how to get more listings, how to obtain more listings. And um, we can help you with those listings because listings need buyers. And the mortgage bankers at BMO Harris Bank talk to a lot of buyers, do a lot of pre-approvals, do a lot of pre-qualifications, and we can help you with that. Number two, partnership, conversation. We need to have really good conversations with you, and one of the ways that we're going to have those conversations with you is we're going to reach out to you, find out what you thought of this session, talk to you about what you would like to hear again in the future. And then the third one is, it just kind of blew me away. So Mark, again, you talked about simplifying the buying process. We do the same thing at BMO Harris Mortgage Bankers, talk about the five simple steps to home ownership. We have a brochure, we walk our clients through that. We are going to speak the same language. We are speaking the same language that you guys speak. So great partnership. We look forward to working together with you. We're gonna ask you for your business and, um, and do some good work together. We have, uh, just last thing, we have four quick giveaways for you, pri uh, uh, going away prizes. And if you could.
you're wrong. We have uh, just last thing. We have four quick giveaways for you, uh, going away prizes, and if you could.